Bailiff, this person is threatening me about a decision that I just made. I'm not threatening you. I have, I'm asking him questions. Did I threaten you? He's threatening as a, as a criminal offense. What was my threat? Come on, sir, you're in custody. Hello, everybody. It's a demo with copblock.org. In June 2011, I was arrested for asking Edward Burke, who's employed as a district court judge in Keene, New Hampshire, a few simple questions. Despite the fact that Edward's accusations had no merit, I was taken into custody and charged with improper influence of a public official, a felony. I was bailed out two days after my arrest so I could retrieve my property and present the video evidence at my upcoming probable cause hearing. A day before my hearing, the city decided to drop the charges against me. Story over, right? Not exactly. Since the alleged crime was a felony, it was sent over to the county prosecutor for review. The prosecutor has the choice to put the case before a grand jury, which was mandatory in order to proceed. At the same time, I filed a complaint with the Keene Police Department stating I believe Edward Burke had committed a crime when ordering me detained and alleged that I had committed a crime against him. Due to the close relationship between the Keene Police, County Prosecutor's Office, and Edward Burke, the whole case file was sent to the Attorney General's Office, whom assigned the case to Mark Hathaway, who was originally employed with the Sullivan County Attorney's Office. I'll be covering a few points of his brief, but the entire document can be read by visiting the related post on copblock.org. It should be noted that my legal name is Adam Miller to prevent confusion through this video. First, to page 8 of the brief. Mark states, There is no evidence in the video recorded interaction between Mr. Miller and Judge Burke to support a finding that Mr. Miller made a threat to harm Judge Burke. Mark continues to break down the actual elements of the crime, but knows there is no way I could have been prosecuted for this because the prosecution would face a, and I quote from page 9, serious challenge based upon the argument that speech is constitutionally protected and or that the statute is overbroad. Basically, this closes the case on my actions that day. Moving on to Edward's actions and the possibility of him being charged with filing a false report. Mark states on page 11, for there to be a completed crime, it must be established that Judge Burke acted with a criminal intent. That is, that he knew the information was false and that he acted with the purpose of inducing an officer to believe that another had committed an offense. By using the reports referenced in Mark's brief, I'd like to go over the actions of that day to see if the facts support Mark's analysis or if this is just another case of the ever-growing double standards public officials have when judging actions by their own. According to page 5 of Mark's report, Edward wrote, As I entered City Hall from the parking garage around 8 a.m., a young man I recognized to be associated with the so-called Free State Movement confronted me immediately. Edward goes on to say, He came up to me, placed the camera fairly close to me, and said he wanted to talk to me about a hat. For the most part, this statement is true, except the placement of my camera. But Edward's statement conflicts that of what Timothy Pelliquin, Keene City Police Officer, stated in his report, which was written the day of my arrest and referenced on page 4 of Mark's report. While entering the lobby today, on his way to the court, he, being Edward, was approached and accosted by a male. He stated that this male thrusted a video camera in his face, that this was described as being in an intimidating fashion that they, free staters, often approach slash question people with. I'm confused. Did I put the camera fairly close, like Edward stated, or did I thrust the camera into his face, like Pelican reported being told by Edward the morning of my arrest? Maybe reading more of Mark's report will help us understand more clearly. Edward states that he essentially asked me to justify my position on hats in the courtroom, follow me through the door that opens to the lobby on the second floor where there were two bailiffs. I believe I said, bailiffs, this man has been threatening me. I then went directly to my office without turning around and not knowing at the time what actions the bailiffs took. This statement by Edward proves he knew my intentions for him to justify his public actions. Edward repeatedly tries to say I was influencing him due to the fact that Bo Davis was jailed on contempt for wearing a hat inside a courtroom. Since the charge was contempt, the judge could release Bo at any time. Yet, I never mentioned Bo's name. I never asked for anyone, let alone Bo, to be released from jail. Therefore, it is irrelevant and very convenient for the judge to use the contempt charge as my influencing. Maybe he was simply upset that someone would question his authority. Just as he stated on page 6 of this report, Edward says, I felt that he was trying to influence my decision-making process. 
both as to the particular hat incident of the day before, as well as my inherent authority to make determinations about courtroom behavior. Now that we've read what Edward has stated, let's walk through our video encounter again. Remember, you're looking to see if Judge Berg acted with criminal intent. That is, that he knew the information was false and that he acted with the purpose of inducing the officer to believe that another had committed an offense. Watch this. Judge Berg, can I ask you a few questions about a hat and how that constitutes contempt? You think people want to pay for someone to be in jail for five days for wearing a hat? It's kind of ridiculous to waste taxpayer money on something like that, isn't it? Sir, I just want to have a conversation. Bailiff, bailiff, this person is threatening me about a decision that I just made. I'm not threatening you. I have, I'm asking him questions. Did I threaten you? It's a criminal offense. What was my threat? Come on, sir, you're in custody. What was my threat? You come in custody, yeah. sir. Man, this is crazy. Now that we reviewed all the details, reports, and watched the video, let's look at Mark's inclusion. On page 11, he states, Burke's statement to the bailiff that he's threatened me, that's a criminal offense, conveys objectively false information, the conclusion that Judge Burke was being threatened. To a law enforcement officer, the mere act of giving false information to a law enforcement officer is, however, insufficient to constitute an offense under RSA 641-4. Mark goes on to say, Judge Burke, within moments of having said, he's threatening me, recognized that he had misspoken and took steps to correct the inaccurate impression he had given with both the bailiffs and the police. The evidence established that Judge Burke's statement, he's threatening me, is properly characterized as a truthful statement of subjective belief uttered in the midst of a stressful event rather than a criminal effort to falsely induce law enforcement to believe that Mr. Miller had committed a crime. Yes, Edward misspoke, that is clear, but he did not, within moments, correct himself. In fact, he stated in his report that he went straight to his office without turning around or knowing what actions were taken. This statement, as seen in the video, is clearly false and written in a report to law enforcement. It proves that Edward didn't correct himself immediately, as Mark would like to believe. If anything, it proves that Edward wasn't happy by the bailiff's non-action. The fact that he turned around and instructed them to arrest me again shows that he was trying to have me arrested. Then, per Pelequin's reports, Edward told Pelequin that I accosted him and thrust a camera into his face. Both accusations are far cries from Edward's later statements, of me putting a camera fairly close to him and wanting to talk. Again, proving that Edward lied. And a lie to a law enforcement officer is criminal. Besides not questioning Edward's lies, Timothy Pelequin refused to conduct a fair investigation of the matter. Even though Burke stated he didn't want special treatment, it is clear it was given. Pelequin talked with Edward for some time that morning. And per Mark's report on page 4, decided to take me into custody after consulting Assistant County Attorney John Webb, and Lieutenant Eli Rivera of the Keene Police Department. Yet, Pelequin refused, over and over, to watch the video I had taken that day. Mr. Miller told Officer Pelequin that he should play the video he made of, the, of his encounter with Judge Burke, and it would show that he had done nothing wrong. What's not stated in the report, though, is how often, or the fact that I was practically begging Pelequin to watch the video, and still he refused. At the end of the day, we have nothing but more double standards from public officials who claim to work for the public but portray a much different reality. I have a friend, Wesley, who's sitting in a cage for six months, in part for providing false information to law enforcement officers. Even though he quickly corrected himself, he was still charged and convicted. Edward, on the other hand, has never missed a day of work, was never held on bail, was never interviewed by Mark for this investigation, and never faced criminal prosecution whatsoever. Yet, he still continues to waste taxpayer dollars, hold personal grudges, and abuse his power. The worst part is, is that no one cares and there's nothing I can do. The simple truth is Edward is upset that I questioned his authority. If I go and film Edward today and ask him questions about this case, he'll lie again and throw me in a jail cell because to him, I'm a crazy free stater who believes in personal accountability regardless of who you work for. I appreciate you taking the time to listen to this complex story. I called all parties involved asking for interviews. Mark Hathaway refused to be recorded, but did state that he stood by his decision. The chief of police sent an officer to call me 
talk about the case, but he refused to be recorded. Though I did have a short phone conversation with Timothy Pelliquin, who stated that the next time a judge orders him to arrest somebody, he may have a few more questions as he feels Edward left him and the King PD out to dry. As always, badges don't grant extra rights, and this is Cop Locked Out Over. After all, I sat in jail for two days.